Pollock. I am currently at Robinson Research Institute, which is part of BIC. Uh, we're up in uh, Lower Hutt, and, and about a few dozen uh, staff members, uh, several students working in all sorts of uh, high-tech stuff, mostly involved in high-temperature superconductors. Um, uh, I joined about a year ago to help uh, develop a group to work on space. That's not what I'm here to talk about uh, much tonight. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about remote sensing from uh, from space. I'll start a little bit with my background. Um, I've uh, been part of a significant part of eight missions that have launched so far. Um, one over to the left was a tech demo uh, for an infrared detector many years ago. I had a short period on Mars. The rest of my career has been doing Earth science and uh, almost entirely atmospheric Earth science uh, until the last one, which was a MIT, which we'll talk a little bit more, which was looking at the surface and turned out to be very good at looking for methane as well. So apparently I'm still working in the atmosphere. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about these uh, four, just as an example of things that may be useful. Uh, Aqua was uh, my first job at the university. Uh, there was an instrument on it called AIRS, uh, which looked at uh, the temperature profile of the atmosphere. Uh, it was credited at the time with about adding three days to the accuracy of weather forecasts. Uh, you know, before that launched, it was very rare for weather forecasts to be published more than five or six days in advance. Now they've published 10 days, though sometimes I wonder why they publish tomorrow, but uh, it still has gotten a lot better. Um, but because of the way it was uh, making those measurements, there were a huge number of measurements of the atmosphere constituents that were a side effect of the way you measure the temperature of the atmosphere. Uh, and they had some of the earliest global methane maps that came out of that instrument as one of its data products. Um, OCO2 and 3 are both, uh, all of these are still operating now. AIRS is approaching the end of its life. The spacecraft has been up there 21 years now, and uh, it is just about out of fuel, so uh, struggling to maintain its orbit. Uh, OCO2 and 3 uh, were put up to measure CO2 concentrations, and I'll talk a little bit later about how that the measurements that were, are made by those instruments might be useful uh, to look at uh, questions related to methane. And then the last one here, and the last thing I did before moving to New Zealand, was to uh, was the instrument manager for a MIT, which was primarily there as a way of measuring the spectral characteristics of dust. The goal was to map desert regions, understand the specific minerals in the sands, so that weather models could take, lift those up into the atmosphere, uh, those dust particles, and then model more accurately how sunlight and radiation, you know, infrared radiation from the Earth would interact with these dust particles in the atmosphere. Um, turns out that just like AIRS was not intended to be looking at methane or carbon monoxide or other gases like that, a mid to make its measurement, you have to know what's in the atmosphere so you can subtract it out and figure out what's on the surface. And in doing so, uh, the instrument um, we managed to launch with enough significant, uh, significant enough of its performance margin uh, that had been designed in early to deal with problems. We launched it just about as good as theoretically possible, and that gave it the sensitivity that when it did its atmosphere correction, was able to do much more accurate methane detection than we'd originally expected. Um, so a little bit about the atmosphere. Well, we're talking about methane here. These are the major constituents of the Earth's atmosphere, and methane's not on the list. Yet it's it's a big deal from a, uh, a radiative forcing is the term of art. Uh, the, the, the way that uh, radiation interacts with the uh, surface in the atmosphere to change temperatures. Um, methane is you know, just a tiny, tiny fraction. If you, if you looked at some of those plots earlier, it was being measured in parts per billion. There's just not much of it out there. However, here's a plot of 
the radiative forcing from various greenhouse gases over the last several decades. The red is carbon dioxide. What's not shown on here is water. Water is the biggest greenhouse gas by far. But water, the water molecule in the atmosphere doesn't stay there very long. So it's, it's, it's something that if everything else were to change, it would come to equilibrium, whatever the background was. So it's not a major forcing gas. CO2 is the big one. But methane, which is parts per billion versus hundreds of parts per million of CO2, is about a quarter of what's going on with CO2. So there's not much of it, but it gets back to that statement that it's an extremely potent greenhouse gas. Um, and there's a different view of one of those charts that was shown earlier about where it's all coming from. Um, but I want to hit it at a different point if you're trying to figure out how to go through the data and figure out where to look. You know, you've got some sources that are extremely localized. You know, there are gas wells. You know, they're, they're, gas wells are not you know, hundreds of square kilometers. They're, they're individual points, often clustered in areas because that's where the gas is easiest to, to bring up. Um, you know, landfills, you can go to them. They're specific places. Uh, coal mining, wastewater treatment, all of these things are things that exist in specific points. And then you have things like this, where you have you know, the agricultural sources are tiny sources multiplied by enormous areas. And it's a very different kind of problem, therefore, to understand what's going on. Um, you know, all of these can be quite diffuse sources. Um, so, moving a little bit into where you can find methane from space, uh, you know, this is not Star Trek where they say, you know, methane signatures detected or whatever. In this case, you're going to look at something. Um, the way most of the instruments do it from space is to look in the near infrared, much like the little cartoon over the, to the left, which is a, was done by one of our artists on uh, OCO2. In this case, you're seeing the CO2 molecules, but it's the same thing looking for methane. The sun comes down through the atmosphere, hits the surface, goes back up through uh, the atmosphere, which is your spacecraft. When it does that, this top curve here is what you would see if you pointed a very accurate spectrometer directly at the sun. What you see is the darker curve is what you see if you look at some sort of average of the Earth, where it's daylight. Um, the difference between those is the atmosphere. Um, and certain colors are very, uh, interact very uh, well with specific wavelengths, or I should say, specific wavelengths of light, colors, interact very well with specific molecules. And it has to do with the energy, the vibrational energy of the various atoms uh, in there. So for instance, you know, right in this area, the atmosphere hardly does anything. It's almost perfectly transparent. But then you have, uh, for instance, this band, I've spent a huge amount of my career looking at, that's oxygen. And very, if you zo keep zooming in, there are points that aren't resolved on this graph that, that literally go down to zero. There are wavelengths of sunlight that cannot make it to the surface and back up through the atmosphere. They will be, statistically, every single one of them will be absorbed. And so looking at those gives you a sense of, if you look, measure the small changes in those, you can therefore figure out differences in the concentration of the gases. Of course, that's only, that's the, that's the in some ways the easiest way to see it. Uh, but that's not the, the, the greenhouse gas effect, uh, effect. That is, of course, you hit, the sunlight's hit the ground, the ground's warmed up, that heat, tries to be radiated out in space, and where the sunlight is coming in, in what we call the visible, you know, what your eyes see, which is less than a micron, for something about room temperature, most of the energy is going out around 10 microns, much longer wavelength, much lower energy photons. And it turns out that those bands, unlike the visible, where most of the light makes it through the atmosphere without much of an interaction in the atmosphere, in the red out here, most of the light is absorbed. Um, water, as I said earlier, 
dominates. Um, but water isn't long lived in the atmosphere, so it's not really a long term problem. CO2, there's a, a couple of smaller bands. Uh, the two big ones are about four microns and out here about um, 15 microns. But methane, which is a, a factor of several orders of magnitude less than CO2, you can see shows up on the graph in a few places, even though there's almost none of it in the atmosphere. Um, and this, this graph does not directly map into, this underestimates the effect that you saw in that previous chart of how big it is relative to CO2. Um, but it's, it's why there's you know, a real emphasis these days on trying to find methane. Um, and I, I wasn't going to walk through, this is a, the first image from EMIT. Uh, so EMIT launched, just a little a personal note here, uh, I left JPL in May. Uh, my last real major work day was in April of last year. My last day in was the day we shipped the, the instrument to the Cape to launch. Uh, my last official day in May was the day we handed over to SpaceX to put it on the rocket. Uh, and in July of last year, uh, we were unpacking the furniture that had just gotten off the ship. And halfway through that day of unloading the truck, I had to get my laptop packed on boxes to watch the launch. So it, it, it was just as I was leaving. This image uh, was taken in late August, I believe. By the time it got taken off the uh, capsule that went up to the space station, robot arm had to install it and check out the instrument. Uh, it turned out, uh, this uh, image is in Australia. It was taken there just because that was the, after the instrument was turned on and prepped to take data, it was the first time the sun was in the right, uh, high enough in the sky underneath the space station to get a good image. And each one of those points is several hundred individual colors. And this is sort of a, a, a visual representation of the different colors and the intensity. Um, but each one of those uh, represents, going back, you know, the equivalent of a spectra like this. Though in this case, it's all it's from about two and a half microns down through the visible. Uh, in fact, I could have just gone to here. And this was some of the first uh, data products that came out. So visible range is about here. And this goes into the infrared. Um, not far enough to get sort of thermal emission for things being hot, uh, what's referred to as the near infrared. And these are sort of averages of some areas that are bare soil, which are hard to see in here, but there are a few in here. And believe it or not, they pulled out some dirt roads. To, to get a measure of what the spectrum of the soil looked like. Uh, there are some rivers through there, and there's vegetation. And you can see, and this is a, the reflectivity of the surface. Um, I'm sorry, the, no, this is one level removed, the radiance. This is the brightness of the light as seen at the space station. And the important part of the science is the wiggles that tell you what's different. If you're looking at the atmosphere, though, you're looking at, I mentioned earlier, the, this is the oxygen band, but there's methane. It's this tiny little wiggle just before the instrument stops working. Um, and this is an example of what the spectra looks like zoomed in, where if you were, did not have much methane, this would have been nearly flat. And this is showing on the on the uh, the red line is a model where they adjusted the amount of methane until it matched the blue line, which is the measured data when you subtract out what was on the surface. And from that, they could make up these maps of methane, where it was a high enough concentration that this was a statistically significant measurement. Um, and again, the methane uh, was not a primary product, but I'm going to go in and show you some. Let's see, oops. <clears throat> 
Oh, I need oh. to slide it over to the other screen. Okay. This yeah, one will yeah. be there. It is. So, oops. Oops. So this is a data visualizer that the emit team put together of all the flights. Um, and let me zoom out a little bit. Sorry, I'm trying to drive sideways. Um, All right. Let's see if that holds there. Uh, so this is the data that is has collected throughout the mission right now in New York. A um, couple of things you notice: it's not very uniform. Uh, partially, that's because the emit primary mission was to look at dusty regions, like I described earlier. The deserts aren't everywhere. Uh, the other thing is, for that mission, don't need to look at oceans. Oceans aren't covered. And finally, the space station is at a 51 degree inclination, so it can't see anything north of 51 degrees north or south of 51 degrees south. Um, the, uh, as you look at it, we also need clear skies, right? You need clear skies and you need uh, the sun to be relatively high in the sky. So I'm going to zoom in. Yeah. So it turns out there is a tiny piece of New Zealand being measured. Because there is an aerosol, sorry, there's just a lag. And there's a University of Auckland has an aerosol monitoring uh, instrument on the roof of one of the buildings there. And EMIT uses the data to verify that the aerosol estimates that are being made by the looking at the spectra match the real data. So there's this section every time the space station flies over Auckland when the sun is more than 45 degrees above the horizon, you can get a little bit of this corner of New Zealand. The reason it's that long is the space station was not designed as a scientific platform. It's not point, it doesn't point very well. So they have to start the data collection like 30 seconds before they're gonna fly over Auckland. And this is just how fast the space station is moving. So in about a minute, you get hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. Um, but of course, we're here to talk about methane. And they do have, jump over to Australia, which has a few plumes that have been detected. And the red circles. And I'm, given how slow this is responding with the network, I won't uh, spend too much time on it. My memory is, if you zoom in on that, that's a lamplet that was found to be emitting methane. Uh, about, I think the last I heard, about six or eight percent of the plumes that have been found by emit are coming from lamplets. Uh, and that's something that's not hard, you know, it's not trivial, but it's not hard to fix. There are plenty of places that actually recover the landfills like in a plastic tarp and then you can burn the gas and, and one of the, the the things about methane of course if you want to deal with climate change at some level it would be better if the methane never came out of the ground to the degree that it's being uh, pumped out but if you're going to pump it out please burn it 
Uh, 20 years of having that incredibly you know, much more potent greenhouse gas effect is one thing, but what a lot of people don't talk about is what happens to the methane after 20 years. It largely gets converted into CO2 anyway. Um, so, you know, if you're going to move to CO2 as your long-term product, burn it first. And at least it, you won't have that 20-year huge amplification of how much it's, it's affecting the atmosphere. Um, I will point out, if you decide you want to work with the MET data, there is a set of um, uh, Python tools that the team has put out on a public GitHub on how to interact with the data. And there are several uh, video uh, so live uh, training events that were done over the last couple of months uh, that are available. So um, to the degree that this may be useful, then great. Uh, I will not repeat the, given uh, the problems I was having earlier, uh, OCO3 uh, is also on the space station, uh, one of the instruments I worked on, and they have a set of uh, target sites that get mapped. Uh, the instrument can only measure about 10 kilometer wide swath. Can't cover the whole planet, and for CO2 that's generally fine because if you're looking at the global scale of CO2, um, you don't have to fly over a smokestack to see it. The winds will carry the CO2 through the path that the satellite and the instrument are monitoring. Uh, however, unlike OCO2, which could not simulate being a, a wide swath imager, OCO3 has a, a relatively agile pointing mechanism and can pick a few places on the planet to make maps that are 100 kilometers on side instead of 10 by the length of the planet. Uh, and they've identified several in New Zealand. Uh, I'll highlight a couple. The, the yellow ones are, if you can't quite read that, it says CIFLO. Um, this is a, uh, forget, solar induced fluorescence is the CIF. Uh, chlorophyll fl um, induced fluorescence is also the way it's described, so it took me a second. Uh, in that oxygen band I mentioned earlier where the atmosphere is almost opaque, it turns out Plants fluoresce when chlorophyll is actually making sugars. And they, it fluoresces brighter than the sun in an incredibly narrow wavelength. So if you see light in that band, you know it came from the plants, not from the sun. Uh, and this was a discovery made just before OCO2 launched that this effect was so bad, is so big, it was going to ruin our measurements of CO2. And so a couple of members of the science team got sent off figure out how to correct for this fluorescence issue. And of course, as soon as they could correct for it, they had to know it well enough to measure it, and it's turned out to be one of the major data products to come out of the CO2 mission, or CO2 mapping missions, is measuring plants, not by looking at whether they're green, but by literally watching photosynthesis as it happens when the spacecraft fly in. And so, to the degree you may be wanting to look at agricultural uh, issues, and especially if you want to have a New Zealand uh, bent for your project, there are a couple of areas around Auckland and then down around Canterbury where every time OCO3 flies over, it tries to make a map of that area looking at this. Uh, there are also a couple of volcanoes that are picked up, uh, which, uh, depending on what's going on with them, may be releasing methane. Uh, the last site on here is actually a validation site. There's an uh, instrument that's run by NIWA that has a huge uh, spectrometer about the size of a shipping container that looks up at the sun all the time in the same bands that this instrument works. So it's another one of these things that you've got this easy, much more easily calibrated instrument on the ground as the spacecraft flies over. They're looking at the same atmosphere, and if they're not getting the same answer, then somebody's got to go off and figure out who's wrong and, and how to fix it. Um, so here are a couple of instruments, and this is not an exhaustive list, that are looking at methane right now, and I want to highlight a little bit that they look at it differently. AIRS, the instrument that I worked on right out of school, had, it's not looking, trying to find point sources. 
fundamentally its data products are measured at sort of 50 kilometer scale, pixels, if you will. However, it does the whole planet twice a day, day and night. It's working in the thermal infrared. Important if you're trying to do weather. Um, GOSAT is a Japanese instrument that I helped a little bit with uh, right after it launched. Works in the near infrared. It kind of covers the planet sparsely every several days, you know, roughly week to week and a half scale. Um, but, but it does it by subsampling. So it looks at you've got these you know, 10 kilometer spots, and it'll jump 50 kilometers and look at another spot, and jump 50 kilometers and look at another spot. And it'll cover the whole planet, but you don't get to see every spot. Um, Sentinel-5 uh, uh, has an instrument called Tropony, which is working in the near infrared. Finer still, they only a little bit, you know, it's, it's global, but it, the instrument that would have the methane can't cover the whole swath. So you, it takes a while to get there. Um, greenhouse gas, gas sat is a uh, commercial uh, group from Canada, I believe they're based. Um, I looked briefly at their website yesterday. It looks like they have some allowance for academic use of their data, even though they're charging people for it. Uh, so it may be worth looking at that as a source of data that you can get today. Uh, and then, of course, emit I talked around about earlier. The important thing with emit is, like I said, the space station is not being managed primarily as a science platform. <clears throat> its orbit is whatever its orbit is. Uh, they don't manage it to make it a great platform for looking down at the Earth. So if it covers an area, it could be weeks before it goes over that same spot again. And you can't, this space station orbit is not well constrained. Um, it, it, you could miss it for months, depending on what uh, altitude it's at and how that processes. Um, a few other things uh, to mention that may be interested as additional products, especially if you want to look at agricultural sources, Look at something called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. This is a classic thing that goes back, Landsat, uh, which has been flying since the 70s in various guises. Uh, groups working with that developed it. It helps you identify both where plants are and something about how healthy they are. It's a, it's a relatively crude metric, but it's computationally cheap, and you don't need uh, really uh, high spectral or spatial resolution. The OCO instruments and, and GOSAT all measure the solvent-induced fluorescence I mentioned, which is a much uh, cleaner, or a, a much more direct measurement of plant health. Uh, and then eco-stress, I missed an R in there, is also on the space station. Um, it's measuring a sense of how water is being used by the leaves of the plants. Um, and again, we'll give you something about plant health. So the degree you're looking at agricultural areas, those are all data products that might be interesting to look at. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, you know, trace gas measurement is hard. Uh, and so as you go look at data sources that are out there, you need to understand a little bit of the complexity. And this is just going to touch on a few issues. But this is a plot from Mauna Loa in red. And um, Ayers, which I've mentioned several times, in blue, uh, looking at CO2. This is uh, part of the Keeling curve. If you've ever studied anything about climate change, you probably have heard about it. It is the longest uh, direct measurement of CO2. There are plenty of historical records you can infer it, but it's been going on, I think, since the early 60s. Charles Keeling started it, and uh, is named after him as a result. What you're seeing there is not that one of them is wrong. What you're seeing there is the red curve is measured by people literally going outside of their lab, taking a very clean glass flask, opening it up, waving it around, closing it, and going back in and seeing how much CO2 is in that jar of air. It's being made at a specific altitude about the height of a person in a specific, very small place. They picked that place because it's on the top of a mountain, out in the middle of the Pacific. It should be clean air as far as you can find it. Ayers is measuring the atmosphere column. It's not measuring the surface CO2. It's measuring the CO2 through the whole column. Well, it turns out that there's a diffusion time between 
CO2 being released at the surface and CO2 making it up through the atmosphere. And so what you sort of see is airs is a couple of years behind. And it takes about a year and a half or two years for CO2 released at the surface to be uniformly mixed through the column as a result of storms uplifting the surface air high enough and then winds carrying it around. The other thing is because of that lag, the seasonal variation of summer, winter, mostly in the northern hemisphere, which is what drives this sine wave, is muted because you're seeing air over the course of the last year, year and a half. And yes, you're most sensitive to the most recent stuff, but not as sensitive as if you were standing on the ground. So again, if you start trying to combine data from various sources, you need to think about how it's collected and what it's really measuring. It's not, you know, again, these are both right answers, uh, even though they look quite different. Um, the next thing is point sources are much easier to find than distributed sources. So this is a map of methane from airs. Thermal infrared, total column, much higher uh, average altitude. Here's a, a tropomy measurement from a few years later. Higher spatial resolution, the, thermal, uh, the near infrared is sensitive a little bit lower in the atmosphere, so you start seeing more structure because of the sources, you're closer to the ground when you're making the measurement, and you're, you're, it's a much finer measurement, so you're able to start picking up individual sources. And then this was the first uh, methane plume data that Emit released. It, you know, not only can you see them quite clearly, I, I, don't, I bet if I ask everyone to write down which way they thought the wind was blowing, you all get it right. I mean, this, is, this is so much easier to interpret because you're actually getting down to a scale that you can see things at the you know, tens of meter scale, not the tens of kilometer scale. So the challenge I believe is in front of this is looking for those diffuse sources. You're not gonna be looking for things like this. Imagine instead of these oil wells which are spewing an enormous amount of methane in a very specific point, you're looking at a field of cows, all of which are emitting a tiny amount all overlapping and those things get hard to see. So you know, there's a real challenge in what they're asking you to do. And I want to point out another example is methane on Mars. Um, and this gets back to there's no right answer. Um, so Curiosity lands on Mars in 2013. It finds not large, but not insignificant concentrations of methane from instruments that are on board the rover. ESA sends Trace Grass Orbiter to Mars, gets there in 2013, or I'm sorry, that's a typo, I think. I copied and pasted, I think it was 2017 when it arrived? Maybe 18, I think it was two cycles later. Can't really find any methane. You know, what are you talking about to the, to the Curiosity team? You know, we can't make our measurements match. Well, there was a big difference. Curiosity did most of their measurements at night because that was the easiest time to make the power available for the instruments. Um, Trace Gas Orbiter was using reflected sunlight. It could not make a measurement at night. Just like I was talking about with the, the Mauna Loa Observatory where somebody went out and waved the bottle around to measure what was in the air. It's got a mass spectrometer that's measuring the, the air sort of at the height of the, the rover deck. The optical spectrometer is making a measurement of the whole column. And right now the understanding is that there probably is a small amount of methane coming out of the ground through some process yet to be determined. At night the winds are low, it stays trapped low, and so Curiosity can see it. By the time you make a full column measurement during the day, the winds have picked up a little bit, Tracecast orbiter, it's so diffuse that they can't see it measuring the kilometers of atmosphere instead of just this little bit near the surface. Um, and that led the Curiosity team to go run the instrument during the day, and sure enough, they couldn't see any significant amount of methane during the day. So that gets back to this, this idea that if you start trying to synthesize data sources of how to approach this problem, um, 
just because they're different doesn't mean any of them are wrong. It means you need to think about how the measurement is really being made. And I would just encourage you to not forget that methane often does not come in isolation. Uh, if you have a fire, it's primarily not methane, it's burning. Um, you know, here's the pollution is mostly CO2 with some carbon monoxide. Here, you know, methane is the major thing you're going to see. The amount of CO2 the cow's releasing is not going to be significant on this scale. Um, rice paddies, uh, you will get a mix of CO2 and methane. Landfills, mostly methane. Gas uh, wells are going to be mostly CO2 if they're flared. Um, and again, it, it seems silly that they're, they're mining the methane, uh, you know, you're mining the methane and not using it. But in, in many cases, if it's an oil well, it's, it's one thing to put the oil, which is a liquid, in. They're not set up to handle the methane that comes off as an accident. And so the normal practice is just to burn it in sight. If that's not happening, you'll see the methane. Um, and then the other issue, which, uh, is going to be a big challenge is permafrost um, and this gets down to as the arctic is warming and you're starting to get microbes waking up after having been frozen for tens of thousands of years uh, and, and starting to break down all the organic matter if it happens in presence of oxygen it puts off co2 if it happens in an oxygen poor environment it will be more methane but one thing to think about is how to use other gases to maybe give you a hint of where to look for the methane. And with that, good luck. I hope this was helpful. But.